Welcome to One Dime Radio. I'm your host, One Dime, and today we'll be chatting with Dr. Philip Armstrong, a heterodox economist who specializes in modern monetary theory, along with various other economic theories, such as post-Keynesianism. Given that I just released a video on the One Dime channel titled The Deficit Myth, The Biggest Lie on Politics, which is all about modern monetary theory and debunking mythologies surrounding the deficit and inflation and various other topics. The question of inflation tends to be the biggest roadblock when it comes to getting people to accept the premises of modern monetary theory. After learning a bit, people usually do come to terms with the undeniable fact that governments that issue their currency and have all of their debt in that currency, aka have currency sovereignty, cannot run out of money. And the question of how can we pay for it is totally ridiculous. But the question that often is hardest to grasp with for people is the question of inflation. If we don't need taxes to fund things like a universal healthcare program, a federal jobs guarantee, or public housing, then increasing the money supply to pay for these things, won't that cause inflation? Doesn't creating more money lead to more inflation? Well, not necessarily. And this is what we're going to discuss in this podcast. All of the misconceptions about inflation that you have ever wondered about. But before jumping into the episode, if you enjoy these podcasts as well as the videos that I do on my One Dime channel, which take a lot of effort by the way, helping me on Patreon would be a fantastic way to support the channel as well as the podcast. Thank you so much to the patrons who have supported the channel so far. Now on to the episode. So Phil... I discovered you on the MMT podcast, which I highly recommend that everyone checks out if they want to learn about modern monetary theory. Uh, It's what I use to kind of, after reading a lot of MMT literature from the likes of Stephanie Kelton and Warren Mosler, it's sort of reassuring to kind of listen to a variety of guests like yourself. You've been on there many times. And I thought your appearances on there were fantastic. And I thought you would be a great guest to talk about inflation. But before we hop into that, uh, what exactly got you into MMT? And uh, just introduce yourself generally and where people can find your work. Uh, Okay, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, I uh, Just to go back a bit, yeah, thank you. I I started um, teaching economics in uh, 1981, so... And main just back in high school in England, in uh, I was teaching A levels, which like uh, uh, is the the English of, uh, equivalent of you know your high school stuff out in the US and Canada. I don't know much about the Canadian system. So sixteen to nineteen year olds I was teaching, uh, and I just taught the syllabuses were given, prepared students for exams. Uh, I did a master's in the uh, mid 80s just to kind of refresh my economics. And uh, I was introduced to post Keynesianism. And that was the first time in my life of, in economics I really found something that was satisfying. It seems to work, it seemed to answer questions, trigger a lot of interest in me. Uh, then I kind of, you know, got married, settled down, had a family, built a career, all those sorts of things. But when there was the sort of financial crisis, uh, uh, in 2007, eight, uh, that really fired me up to start thinking a little bit more about Paul's kids. As I get a little bit older then, uh, and I started doing more reading about stuff. Uh, I started attending sort of staff seminars at my old university, which is Leeds. Um, and then I came across this guy called uh, Warren Mosler. Uh, and what was interesting about what he said, it answered a lot of questions so it, that I'd never been able to work out before. And I, I think I've said this on the MMT podcast. I, I was possibly clever enough to work out that post-Keynesianism wasn't complete, but I wasn't clever enough to understand why. Warren explained that. He taught me MMT. Uh, you know, he's lightning fast guy. But uh, I picked up quite a lot of MMT from him. And from that point, I've got more and more involved in, if you like, the MMT community. I've written a lot of uh, academic papers, some of them with Warren, which are on the Gower Initiative site. Uh, I've written some other academic papers um, and a book, which is called uh, Can Heterodox Economics Make a Difference, where I interview a lot of uh, 
economists of different types about their views of money, heterodoxy, MMT. Uh, that's a very expensive book, and I apologise for that. But uh, so that's kind of where I am. I've gone come through post Keynesianism, uh, added MMT's insights to that. I am now kind of in semi retirement. I work closely with the Gower Initiative, giving talks. Obviously, I'm, I do a lot with the MMT podcast. Uh, I'm always eager to talk to people about MMT, but I'm a pluralist. You know, I, I'm interested in the contributions of other heterodox schools um, like post Keynesianism, uh, Temporal Single System Interpretation of Marx. I, I particularly appreciate ecological economics. You know, these sorts of people I love to meet and discuss. And I'm very interested in philosophy and methodology, particularly uh, critical realism, uh, as developed by Tony Lawson, Jamie Morgan. So that's my kind of current position. Yeah, I, I really think MMT is the type of thing that once you learn it or quote unquote get it, there's a certain yeah. point where you you're first skeptical on the fence, but once you sort of get it, it, there's no sort of going back. And not to say that it's an orthodoxy of any kind. I I, I almost don't even like to look at MMT as really a theory, just more of a description that one realizes or gets. And it's very it can be complementary with other different schools of thought, like you said that you're a pluralist and like many other schools of thought, post-Keynesianism, Marxism, it's, it is complementary with those. It's not complementary with uh, orthodox um, neoclassical economics or Austrian school economics, but uh, it, it is, it is very fascinating. That's why I decided to make a whole YouTube video on that. And um, yeah. so people listening to my podcast might've seen that video uh, when it, by the time they're hearing this, but just for those who haven't, uh, would you like to give a brief overview of what MMT is and its main points? Yeah, I mean, if I go on too long, just just stop me. But uh, <laughs> I think what one one of the things is different ways in, like different perspectives, you know. So you could approach from different angles. But one angle I might approach you from is, is to look at. Uh, look at money now if you if you looked at money in an orthodox perspective what what people would say is well at some unknown point in the past you know people were bartering things and then people sort of decided that well bartering wasn't very efficient and we ought to use one commodity that everybody recognized and thought it was the best for the job and so instead of exchanging you know sandals for fish or stuff we'll swap anything for this special commodity which you can then swap for anything else and this is called money uh and and that's how it started it started from sort of if you like individual maximizing agents and then later on along came governments or major stakeholders and they kind of pirated the system so they drew off some of this money which was somehow generated within this nexus, private individual nexus, uh, and then wasted it all in, in a profligate way. So go governments were seen as sort of late additions to the creation of money, uh, and generally speaking, a bad and malevolent influence. Um, where MMT rejects that whole approach and says the MMT money story starts from the state. And now, obviously, I, I, you know, that's quite a big leap of faith. And there's a lot of MMT literature. Warren Moore's has written. I have written stuff myself about the, the history of money. But without you say going David in, Graeber's debt. David Graeber has that? written years, 5,000 yeah. years of debt. MMT is quite consistent with that. And if you look at this barter story, even the Austrian school call it a conjectural history. In other words, they're not saying it really happened or when it happened. It's just a plausible story upon which to base their creation myth of money. Now, I would argue that if you look at the historical evidence, and there's much of it, Randy Ray is the main uh, MMT writer on this, you will find that that money originates from the state 
and various states in ancient empires. But in essence, without talking too much about the history here, I'm mean, obviously some of your listeners would be interested in doing that. And if they are, you know, R- Randy Ray's uh, uh, State and Credit Theories of Money. He has a great lecture series uh, on YouTube that I watched literally about what you're saying about the um, what is modern monetary theory and the history of money. And he kind of goes over the barter and whatnot. Very fascinating yeah, stuff. Yeah. Highly recommend it. Yeah. If we do the MMT money story, it starts off with a state or a powerful authority that wants to provision itself. You know, if you've got a, a leader or an emperor or a government, they need the need resources. And those resources usually labor. And they have to provide a means, create a mechanism by which they can, if you like, shift resources from the private sector to themselves. And the easiest way of doing that is to introduce a tax liability. So for MMT, as that comes first, and sequence is very important. So if you imagine states there, it wants resources, it puts the tax liability on the private population. Now, the problem is once the private population got a tax liability, and we could, for simplistic, you might say the state's coins, just take that as an example, it hasn't got any coins to pay to the tax collectors, which leaves it in severe difficulty of imprisonment or whatever. So now that tax liability has been imposed, the government can actually spend money all right, and it can buy the resources it wants. So in other words, it creates willing sellers of goods and services. So people think, well, I I need to get hold of this state money to pay me taxes. So what I'll do is I will go and work for the government. Maybe, you know, maybe say it was like in uh, in ancient times, you might work for them to build build maybe a palace or two, and that enables you to access the state money so you can pay your taxes. And on top of that, obviously you wouldn't tax away all people's state money, you would leave them some when with which they can spend on other items created by other private sector agents. And so that will then circulate and create employment in the private sector. And then but, uh, obviously where it will stay in the system and become eventually net saving. So if you like, the government has to, if you like, spend sufficient for the for the uh private sector to pay its tax liability and satisfy net savings demand. And that's the MMT. It asks government spends first, taxes later, and taxes don't fund spending. If you like, government spending funds taxes. Right, right. I mean, to simplify uh, for, for the listeners, basically taxes are a way to get people, for the gov- for the government to get people to do something, to yes, build a society. Exactly. and. And one would say, yeah, it's coercive. I mean, it basically is. And this is something yeah. that actually Marxist theorists and various theorists recognizes that the state's very foundation is coercive. Even liberal yeah. thinkers, too, will recognize yeah. that it is coercive and that we sacrifice our freedom, quote unquote, mm-hmm. for to, to live in this organized society, as people like uh, John Locke would say. Uh, so, so, yeah, War- Warren Mosler is described often as the founder of MMT, but... Many would say that uh, a lot of the assumptions of MMT aren't particularly new. And I know MMT theorists acknowledge this for sure. Mm, uh, yeah, that, yeah. that the state theory of money originates in mm-hmm. uh, chartalism. Yeah. And um, a lot of other assumptions of MMT, like a lot of the policies, although I, I know it's it's f- difficult to kind of say MMT has any policy prescription because mm. it doesn't, mm. but a lot tend to prescribe stuff like a federal jobs guarantee, mm. uh, stuff like that, which Keynes, Keynesians uh, support. Yeah, yeah. And so w- w- is MMT really new or is it more well, a synthesis of older ideas? That's interesting. And I have a personal view uh, and I'll give you that view and it may be I might actually use Copernicus as an example right now. I'm not an expert in the history of astronomy uh, and and there may be some of your listeners that are and you must forgive me. I'm just using it as an illustration. So let's take a view that, you know, Copernicus through a flash of inspiration gets an inkling or an idea that maybe the sun's at the middle of the solar system not the earth, and he develops his theory, publishes his work. 
Uh, and he becomes associated with developing that as the creation of a man. And it takes a while, and then other people pick that theory up and develop it in different ways, you know, Kepler or Galileo being two that come to mind a little bit later in time. Now, what's interesting is that Copernicus, his theory, well, had been mentioned in ancient Greece. I mean, if my memory serves me like by Aristarchus. So it wasn't absolutely new. Some people probably seen it and had inklings, or I might use the word antecedents. Now, if you look at Warren, what, what Warren did, what he, what he would call Mosler economics, which predates MMT, he saw what we're talking about, this concept of sequence, the idea that the government spends or lends before it needs to tax or borrow, that the government's a monopoly issuer of the currency and necessarily price is a function of the prices paid by the state. The key insights of MMT, he saw those. Uh, now, when he founded, you know, the University of Kansas City, Missouri's sort of, I don't know, there's, there's a title for that, which I forget. And he, I know he was, he was very instrumental in coffee out in Newcastle. A lot of people then who were interested in the MMT school were looking for antecedents and trying to find that out. And that's where people like Innes, who developed the credit, theory in 1913 14 and then 1924 for well the english translation of knapp with the state theory so warren didn't know about that when he saw it. It, it, it it but it was there and it was discovered and the links were found i mean i don't know whether copernicus knew about aristarchus maybe he did maybe he didn't but so it isn't entirely new in that sense and it is influenced by elements of Keynes. But Warren didn't read all of Keynes's books and then he just saw it. What happened? Yeah, he worked he first hand there. in the um, in the banking industry as well. As yeah, he, 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 and, and he too. used that. Yeah and, and, yeah. and obviously he was very successful in his tra career in trading and he knew mm -hmm. all the guys on the Fed floor. You know, his, his sort of times in dealing with bond trading, he just sees things other stones, you know, and at the moment I'm writing his biography. It's a long-term project. I'm interviewing people from his past. So when I interview former colleagues in trading, I'll say, you know, was he the cleverest among you guys? And I go, yeah. And they often say either word for word or close, he sees things other stones. So he can look at us, he can look at something that's happening. And he sees the system and he doesn't know why he does. He just does. It's almost like looking at, I don't know whether you call them the same over in Canada, the US, a magic eye picture. You know, when you look at something and behind it, there's another image and some people can see it and others can't. You know, the way I like to think of it is Warren, Warren is sort of like Mike, what people think Michael Burry is. Uh, right. you know, the, the big short people kind of have this idea of Michael Burry as a sort of, genius who kind of saw the contradictions in the financial yeah. system but yeah, yeah. in reality michael burry actually has a very backward idea of backward understandings of economics so it seems because he kind of uh, i don't know if you've seen the news he he's predicting hyperinflation weimar republic style in the united states which it, i cannot understand how he can possibly conceive that but um speaking of mosler you wrote a fantastic paper about weimar germany sort of debunking the misconceptions about what caused hyperinflation there. But before we jump into that, what is the MMT perspective on inflation? And for those who are very new to this, what, do you, what is inflation? What are the different types of inflation? And what are the misconceptions about it that people like maybe Milton Friedman, uh, I think I was responsible for a lot of bad misconceptions that it's always mm -hmm. a monetary phenomenon. So people think yeah. it's the money supply and that if you print money, or we, you know, we don't print money, but create money, mm. the more money you create, you'll automatically lead to more inflation. That's how a lot of people see it. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, there are, within the MMT community, there are different nuances on inflation. And I'd like to say that, um, for starters, Warren has a particular view, and I tend to be sympathetic to that view. Uh, 
but there are others like other what I would argue as complementary insights to what Warren says. Uh, and I'll put that down. The first thing I would say about inflation is that it's a complex phenomenon and it can have multiple primary causes. So the idea that it always comes from one primary cause, which is excess money printing or creation, is totally false, totally ridiculous, and based upon very bad economics. And I'll come back to that in a moment, in a sense. And then you might say, well, what is inflation? Well, if you look at a definition of inflation, it says it's a continually a continuous or sustained increase in the level of prices. Now, the problem with that is you, you have to decide what the level of prices is. Now, at a point in time, you, you can't really define that. So what people normally do is they build as you know an index of prices, a consumer price index, say, where weighted average of you know, according to how important things are. Uh, in in um, what people buy. So then you would have an index, call it 100 in a base year. Now, if that those prices went up a bit in the following year on average and say the index was 102, so I had 2% increase in prices, people would come on the telly and say, well, we've got inflation. But is it really inflation? Let's say what we just said, it has to be a continuous and sustained rise in the level of prices. Well, what if that 2% rise had been because, say, there was a shortage of food, maybe, maybe there was a, I don't know, a bad harvest of wheat, say, and wheat was an important product, and the price went up, and then the next year, wheat was fine again, and price level went back down to 100, or stayed at 102. <coughs> would we be in inflation? I would say no. So the problem is that people call an increase in the price index as inflation, whereas technically it's not. So for me, inflation has to be a sustained, continuous rise in the general level of prices. And there has to be some dynamic behind that where it's rolling itself forward. You know, if there's a price increase in a particular commodity, which is temporary, well, that, that's just a market adjustment, you know. So if as the oil price goes up and the prices go up, then next year they don't go up again. Well, that's not inflation. It's a price rise. And, it, and yeah. it, we could talk an awful lot about what inflation is. But to me, it has to be, it has to be sustained and it has to, you know, be, there must be some sort of process behind it sustaining. Now, obviously, you get an element of subjectivity in that. But what I'm saying, a one-off increase in the price level, to me, that's not inflation. I wouldn't call that inflation. Yeah. Um, I mean, if there's a scarcity of, let's say, Xboxes, and the price of yeah. Xboxes goes up, is that inflation? Right, just the price. Uh, no, no. So, no, it's but, just the but price um, increase of Xboxes. Yeah, I, I, so I also, I also kind of, kind of use a similar definition that you use and that Warren uses is a continuous increase in the price level. Now, I also find it useful sometimes to separate the old school distinction between cost push inflation and demand yeah. pull because I find cost push inflation is usually the type that we're discussing right now, which is often misconstrued for like, you know, just uh, for example, like we see, I think a lot of cost push inflation right now, that was the yeah. next question I was going to ask you about with the energy shortages and whatnot. And because of that, obviously a lot of things that require transportation costs and require energy mm -hmm. as well as other things like semiconductors and shortages mm -hmm. and that too, those prices are going up and people are seeing that they're saying, oh, we have inflation everywhere. A lot of people, you know, the opportunists, similarly to kind of mm. what happened after the OPEC shock mm. in the 70s, people are running and saying, it's the money supply, it's the money mm. printing, it's reckless spending. Mm. How would you address that? And what is actually more so the causes behind inflation we are seeing now in like the UK, Canada, the United States? Because we're, we're seeing it there quite consistently going up like prices, not everything, obviously, but imported goods, especially. Yeah, I think 
one one thing I would say about the money supply, the quantity of money in the system, is where the problem lies with the money supply is quite deep. Now, uh, there's a thing called the classical dichotomy. Now, what that is is you have like a real economy where you know people are making things, trading things, and then money is added on as an after effect. So what happens is the money supply merely determines the price level. So you've seen it. So in other words, there is an economy which at least analytically is separable from the quantity of money. And so if, I don't know, a car was twice as valuable as a motorbike, then if you chuck a load of money into the system, say the car would be $2,000 and the motorbike be $1,000. And if you double the money supply, then, you know, the car would go up to 4,000, the motorbike goes up to 2,000, but the relative values remain the same. So all, that's all money does. Now, if you were like a, a real purist, what you would say is you chuck money in and it immediately raises the price level. But if you're a bit more subtle, you might say, oh, there's some sort of lag in the system. But the assumption is in this is that prices reflect the money supply. So the primary cause of inflation, and I use that word primary because I think it's quite important for your listeners, is an increase in the money supply. So if you see inflation what, and a rise in price index, then someone somewhere has injected more money into the system. Now, the problem with that approach is that money, as we said, is not something that is, is separable from the real economy. It, money is part of the system itself. And that classical dichotomy is, a, if you like, an abstraction which takes us down the wrong route. And what actually happens is the quantity of money is best conceived not as determining the price level, but being determined by the price level. So what happens is, mm. for example, prices generally are administered, you know, like someone sets a price. When the price is set by someone, they will try and sell it at that price and they will buy labor at the going price. Uh, and if prices are going up, Say, say a firm will find that its wage costs are going up and its price of raw materials will go, it will administer a higher price and say, well, we'll have to charge more then. And that's before anyone's ever bought anything. Now the problem is the firm has obviously got to pay its workers more. And so the money supply has to expand passively to me. Yes. the higher price level. Now, that's always the case. Now, obviously, the state could insist and shut down all the banks to prevent the money supply expanding to allow the system to work, but is crashing the monetary system the right way around? Because it's not the primary cause. The primary cause, say, would be a cost increase. Say, when in the oil crisis, for example, the price of oil goes up, firms then have to pay more for raw materials, more for labor, because trade unions are pushing up the wage costs, so they administer a higher price. And the money supply has to expand in line to, you see what I mean, to allow the system yeah. to function at the higher wage rate. But it's not the primary cause. You know, somebody at the central bank didn't come in one day in 1973, mm -hmm. get a coffee, and say, uh, okay, then let's crank up the printing presses. Why? Well, I just fancy causing a bit of inflation because I'm a government and I'm profligate. It didn't happen like that. And if you were going to conceive it, and this is very, very important, when the price level rises, generally speaking, the money supply rises in line with prices, not the reverse do you see what I mean? And that's a critical yeah. distinction. I mean, that's... And nowadays... Nearly, sorry, I'm interrupting. I'm, oh, no, I'm no, no worries. Yeah. Actually, no, go ahead. I think you were onto something really interesting right there. I, I was just trying to... So what we've got then is, is cost rise, like you were saying. Cost rise, wages, raw materials. For firms then administer higher prices. And then the money supply 
will expand to do that. Now, obviously, if prices rise, trade unions raise wages, or uh, wages are indexed to the price level, it can make a continuous price rise that we were talking about, and you will get inflation. And the money supply has to rise to allow that to happen. Otherwise, the system would crash. You know, imagine that you were a firm and you would increase your prices by 10% and you were paying your workers 10% more. Uh, because I, and then the government said, oh, well, we're not having that. You, we're we're going to shut all the banks. We won't allow you that. Then the system would crash and everybody would, well, I must say everybody would starve, but there'd be riots in the streets. So, you know, it's like saying, well, are you going to cure a bad finger by chopping your arm off? I don't think so. You look at the primary cause and the primary cause is not monetary expansion. And my argument would be that virtually none of my, and I'm an old guy, inflation we've observed has been primarily caused by excess money printing. It just hasn't happened. It's all been cost push and the money suppliers move forward in sync with that. And when right. cost push and wage presses are low, price level remains uh, relatively stable. So the money supply doesn't need to move up in the same pace. So it's 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 this crazy idea that when people observe price level rises, that someone somewhere, a central bank has pressed, lent his elbow on the print money key. <laughs> it's stupid and wrong, period. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how a lot of uh, libertarians are uh, kind of see what's happening now. They think that Biden and the Fed are just insane and that they're just out here aimlessly printing money and that this is what it's going to lead to now uh what you're saying about sort of the money supply increasing following the increase of the price yeah. level rather than the other way around is more or less kind of the argument uh you and warren make in the paper about weimar germany which we'll get to in a second mm. but before i know there's some people who's going to just be listening to this who will be saying, well, what about cost push inflation? Isn't that a real thing? And yes, theoretically, mm -hmm. right. Um, if if the government was to increase the money supply, I don't know, by a, a universal basic income or job guarantee, which would give people more disposable income or whatever, the various ways to increase the money supply. And this, the quantity of goods and services stayed the same. That would lead to inflation, would it not? Because then well, people would just jack up prices. Yeah, but what you have to be careful with this is that it's not about the quantity of money, and this is an insight that Warren stresses perhaps more than any of the other MMTs, is this is about the price paid. I'll give you an example. Let's say you were going to buy something online. Uh, I don't know. Uh, say you're going to buy, uh, I've got to think of something you buy. You might buy quite a lot. Say you've got a dog when you're buying tins of dog food. You know, I got a couple of dogs. Hopefully, they won't bark and disturb this. But say there's a tin of dog food, uh, and uh, say you get a four pack for a dollar, all right, and you were buying it online, and you kept on buying it. And when you buy your four pack of dog food for a dollar, and then another one, and another one, the price level doesn't go up, does it? You listen, it doesn't suddenly automatically rise; it just stays. And you can keep on buying quite a lot of things at a dollar now obviously if people went crazy and kept on buying and buying more and more dog food and um, it might get that, that these suppliers couldn't get any more dog food at a dollar uh and in which case what they might have to do is perhaps bid for more labor from other resources you know what i mean so or, for example, people in private markets might be selling dog food for more than a dollar to each other. So the answer is it's not really about a quantity of money per se. It's about the prices you pay. So if you've got spare capacity, if people buy things at a set price, then the price level remains the same. If people bought more and more and more dog food and we had a huge supply of dog food and plenty of spare resources, we can keep on buying dog food at a dollar for these four packs and the price level would remain exactly the same. All right. So it's not spending or increasing the quantity of money by spending. It's the prices paid that matter. Mm. If you see what I mean. And fundamentally, yeah. you know, 
uh, I don't anyway. I don't, I don't want to uh, keep going on to another point. You, you might want to come back at me on that. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Well, if let's say the government increased the money supply, it wouldn't be the the prices increasing would be on the employers or uh, company monopolies of certain things that would be increasing yes. the inflation. But it often companies will increase the prices when they see that people have more excess demand, right? So someone yeah. could point to that and say, well, it is the government increasing the supply, but we also have, the, the government has many ways of reduce, of preventing that from happening, of, of like price controls, for example. Yeah, I know yeah. economy, a lot of economists hate price controls, but mm -hmm. we can see so many examples in history of, for example, like the Soviet Union, when after the fall of the Soviet Union, when they removed all the price controls mm -hmm. with shock therapy, we saw hyperinflation temporarily, uh, yeah. as well as in uh, after Allende uh, mm -hmm. getting uh, cooed uh, by Pinochet, and then mm -hmm. the Chicago boys coming in there implementing shock therapy, hyperinflation. So, I mean, we can, for example, let's say, or there's also rent control, there's various price controls, which economists hate, but can offset mm -hmm. that effect of the price yeah. increase um in response to increases in the money supply what would you say about that because i know a lot of well, economists will just say price controls are evil they're bad like for what i mean i think that the guys that don't like it are ones that are what like market i don't know that they worship markets and they have like some <laughs> sort of vision True. in their heads that markets are all perfectly competitive and there are very few, if any, that are. Now, I would, if you go back to price controls, you have to say, well, is it justified? So, for example, if you had a competitive market and firms were actually, you know, treating their work as well, they were acting, you know, environmentally soundly, and they found that the products that they were buying, say the raw materials, were, were, there was a shortage. So you might argue, well, in that case, it's reasonable to allow that one product to rise in price. And I would agree then that, yeah, a price control, maybe that wouldn't be the right thing, wouldn't be efficient. However, is that the real thing that we're talking about? No, because very few markets are competitive. They're oligopolistic. Now, would it be right, for example, for a large conglomerate to buy out a load of buildings and then charge very high rents to make a lot of profits because their students or people who are on low incomes have nowhere else to go. Now, it's, they're very different situations. Now, in the latter, I would say, yeah, rent controls are correct because I don't worship markets. I think they have a role to play. Yeah, yeah, of course they do. But the state sets the rules. It's a privilege to operate a private business. So what you would say to private businesses is, and I'm, I'm moving slightly to one side, right? These are the rules, Dem democracy sets the rules. For example, you have to pay your workers a minimum wage where they can live well. You have to protect the environment. You have to use health and safety. If you can do all those things, you can be innovative, you can be competitive, and we'll, we'll, away you go and do well for yourself and your family. Great. If you say, well, I can't afford to operate my business if I don't pay people any more than $5 an hour, which, well, exit the industry. <laughs> you know, good if you can't do that. Or if you, you know what I mean? If you keep hiking prices by engaging in cartels, well, you're going to be punished for that because it's wrong you're breaking the rules. Do you yeah, see what I mean? That's exactly so, what they do, though, right? So, it, well, exactly. And it, and what, what it, always baffles, it always baffles me, though, how even neoclassical economists wouldn't get that because if if something for example has an inelastic demand people will want mm. it regardless the price setters are always going to jack up price regardless yeah. if if there's an increase in the money mm. supply or not so mm. I, I i don't see how one could oppose price controls in something like i don't know uh, broadband or uh, rent or health care so many things that people need and depend on that are uh, you, it's hard to, there's going to be high prices if the market is allowed to set them freely. I think what, what I would say on that point, on, on, on face value, what you said is absolutely right, that how could an intelligent person who is a neoclassical economist, could see it's obvious that 
price controls are justified in numerous real world oligopoly situations, come what's obvious. And, and the reason they wouldn't do that is it's not what they do. I mean, the problem with mainstream economics is mainstream economists don't study the real world. What they do is they, they study imaginary worlds and they use formal mathematical reasoning. Now, in their worlds that they study, most of the time, they study in markets. They might have little things like information failures or asymmetric information, but they really study in market structures where the world's viewed as some sort of gigantic auction, you know? I mean, I'm caricaturing a bit, but the problem is that what they do isn't really economics, and they, that's why they can't deal with the real world very well. And on a bigger scale, you know, say there's a financial crash and you'll see this on the TV, you know, over in North America, they'll probably flash from some bullet into some professor of mainstream economics and they'll be sat in an office somewhere with his braces on and a load of books on shelves behind him. They'll say, well, Professor, <laughs> professor Smith-Jones, what do you think about this? And he'll try to come up with an answer and he'll mumble a bit and he'll talk about interest rates or something. And the reason is he's not doing that during the day. He's not talking about the real world. What he's doing is doing very complicated mathematical modeling with yeah. loads and loads of Greek letters. <laughs> That's what they do. Yeah. Uh, they're called That's dynamic awesome. stochastic general equilibrium models, and they've got very little to do with the real world. Now, that is the problem. They can't really comment on it because it's not what they do. <laughs> and it's that's almost why the they're very much caught on the hoof all the time. It's almost like it's the opposite of empirical because they're imposing abstract models on reality as opposed to deriving their models from reality. Right? Yeah, the... Exactly. They start off with what they call a self-evident truths, deductivism, and then they deduce models from that. Then apparently they test their models against reality. Now, this is kind of Friedman's methodology. And so really, all their theories are, are very abstract. And in principle, they're testable. But what happens if they fail any tests? They just say, oh, well, conditions have changed, so it's not falsified. So neoclassical economics is just pseudoscience. No matter what it says, they won't accept being falsified. All their models failed in the financial crisis. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to call them new, you know, variants of new, you know, Austrian school, new classical, neoclassical, the whole, they all fail, but they're all still got jobs, you know, because right, right. they just said, oh, well, uh, unforeseen shock. You know, well, what's that mean? Let's speak English. They got it wrong. You know, you know, you can't, if, you false if you insulate yourself from falsification, which is what they do, and by their own admission, their theories are abstract and don't explain anything. What have you got left in the bucket? It's empty. Mm -hmm. And the only reason they've survived is that by a deliberate policy of restricting academic freedom in economics, they've they've become the only game in town, so they're effectively chased heterodox economics into business schools and economic geography and things right right yeah and the problem becomes is trying to get these mainstreamers to acknowledge they were wrong but it i might meet mainstreamers and they don't even think i'm doing economics because i'm not an abstract modeler you know i don't i don't mm -hmm. work deductively i look at the real world i try to i look at the real world and go well, what mechanisms are at work to that might lead to what I see. And then I form an hypothesis and I test it. And that's what MMT is do. We've got a hypothesis of how the world works and we test it and it works. It explains what happens, you know, it explains why yield curves went down when the def government deficits went up, mm -hmm. which is a big thing. It was a big suggestion for, you know, the reverse was true, wasn't it? By neoclassical, they all said, oh, government deficits after the crisis, you know, they're all massive, so yield curves, long-term interest rates are going to go massively high and we get crowding out. They all went down. MMT explains yeah. that, they don't. So, but they're still in jobs, you know, why? 
and, and that's a deliberately provocative question that if you're an engineer that built bridges and they all fell in the river over and over again, you lose your job. Well, None this of is, these this is, mainstream is getting anything right, you know? Well, this is where I, the Marxism in me kind of comes out because I think it's, I, I refuse to believe that so many of the people in power are just so stupid. And I mean, it's because they're benefiting really from these type of policies. And that's where the class conflict comes in. And uh, yeah. sometimes I like the way people like David Harvey, Marxist writers like him, yeah, characterize yeah. it. It's neoliberal economics was really just an abstract way to justify a redistribution of wealth from the poor to the rich. Yes, or, you're right. Yeah. And, and it, I might add something to that is the very irrelevance of Main Street economics is great. It's a slightly different nuance, but it fits in with what you say. If you imagine you've got all these mainstream professors who are doing all this abstract modeling with loads of maths in it, that's got nothing to, or hardly anything to do with the real world. They're so distant from reality that, they, that if you like, the elites or those in power that benefit from neoliberalism, things like increased inequality, destruction of the environment, depressing the wage share, all these things that, you know, Marxists would draw our attention to. Well, they're fine with mainstream economics because it doesn't interfere with them. It's irrelevant. You see what I mean? It's like they can pick a paper up, which is full of maths, and say, you know, Professor Gloggins agrees with us, you know, because he might say markets are great. So it's a fabulous partnership, isn't it? Don't you think you've got political forces, reactionary forces, depressing the wage rate, destroying the environment, increasing inequality, and you've got a very lucrative mainstream economics profession doing very abstract formal maths with nothing to do with reality. The two don't really have much of an overlap, but when they do, they're irrelevant to each other, and so they're just both happy in their own little worlds, doing right. really well on nice pensions. Now, I'm being slightly cynical, but I think if you use that as a working hypothesis and go out into the world, you will find there's very little overlap between what mainstream economists are doing, other than a very general faith in markets, and what governments, particularly right-wing governments, actually put into practice. Yeah. And I mean, it's also the way they interpret their own findings, right? Is yeah. uh, sometimes what, what I, th I found, I saw a paper in the Wall Street Journal that was fear mongering about Bernie Sanders public housing program. They're saying it would cause real estate deflation. And that's basically a fancy way of saying it'll make real, it'll make homes and rent cheaper for people. Right? Yeah. And um, it, it's it's funny too because th this sort of brings us to the back sort of back to inflation because some increases in the, some policies that cost trillions of dollars are actually deflationary as uh, yeah. Warren Mosler uh, and you write is that for example like universal health care would make mm -hmm. costs much cheaper as well as a public yeah. housing program would lower the overall values mm -hmm. of real estate and uh, the amount of rates landlords can uh, set mm -hmm. so yeah yeah yeah. I mean, without any question that if you look at, say, the UK compared to the US, the amount of money and the price of healthcare in the US is way higher than us. Uh, and yet we've got a complete, well, it's been nibbled out of the edges of privatization, which we're all trying to. Yeah, fight Canada against. has a very similar system to the NHS. Like yeah. it's a and, public, and, and but it privatized be, partly. Yeah, and, and we have to fight against privatization because. You know, Noam Chomsky always says the best way you can, you know, move things from the public to the state sector, like deliberately underfund it so it looks as though it's failing, and then you can sell it off. Well, the state issues the currency, so why does it ever need money from the private sector? It doesn't. It's just, I don't know, it's like in, the, in Canada, in the, U, in the UK, we have too much revolving door policy, where like politicians, too many of them, particularly in the Tory part, but also in some of what I might call new Labour, you know, Tory lights. What they do is they get nice jobs as MPs, but the salary isn't that good, you know, 85K, you know, maybe with a few benefits. So what I want to do is look good, look appealing. So when they leave, they maybe get a job for a nice healthcare firm and a big million pound salary. Again, I'm being I had slightly money in cynical. Panama. 
like uh yeah like Blair. And, and it's all part of the system you know that a privately owned healthcare system you have to waste real resources on on lawyers advertising all you don't need to bother with that just go in get your health care come away you know private health care it offers nothing there's there's to me it's a moral stance anyway health care is not a commodity you can buy and sell it should be provided at source currency issuer mm. done deal you know maybe just maybe there are aspects of healthcare i don't know like cosmetic surgery or something that and I don't mean like people who've maybe had a burn or an acid attack or something, but somebody maybe says, well, I, I want my ears cha- changing just so I look better. You might argue that should not be in the state sector, but everything which I would call conventional medicine, again, I'm digressing. You don't need private stuff in that. It won't improve, it'll make it worse, you know, yeah. and it's not complicated to work out why people are saying you need private health care because they're starting to benefit financially. Uh, and there are a lot of politicians, unfortunately, in that school. You know, I'm digressing slightly, but and it's very expensive to run a private health care system because you've got all those people doing all those things that aren't needed, you know, like advertising and insurance, as I said, these workers are probably clever and they could be doing something useful. You know, the, the right. cleaning plastic off a beach, for example, would be a lot more useful. I mean, and, and this is something I say a lot in the video is that to, to believe, to, to really justify this system, one has to swallow a lot of ideology. And the way I yeah. understand ideology is, is very much in a, in a Gramscian sense, as well as Althusser, uh, the French Marxist, is yeah. ideology is not, it's not something we um, escape by just putting on glasses. It's more like glasses we already have that we have to take off. Yes. And uh, because I notice sometimes people who have no background in economics will grasp the intuitive truths of MMT more than a, a schooled ideological neoclassical economist. And I, I yeah. think it, there was there was a meme that was floating around a lot. Uh, I think during the Bernie Sanders campaign, when um, you know they kept asking Bernie Sanders how he's going to pay for it, how is he going to pay for it? Mm. There was this <laughs> there was this like teenage girl who made a TikTok video mm. uh, uh, saying like in, in a kind of funny sense, I don't mm. get it. Why can't, if, if the, the government makes the money, it says, it says it's mm. US dollars. Why can't we just make more and pay for it? And she was saying yeah, something yeah. and there was some, there was some MMT people on Twitter, like, yeah, this, she unironically gets it. And then there was mm. some, you know, uh, libertarians who were like, ha oh, ha basic economics. You don't get it. Like, mm. uh, and, and that, that just shows a bit how sort of hegemony works is it's the kind of thing that. Yeah. Yeah. You unlearn, yeah. Young, I guess. young people are, I'm not, you know, they're, they're critical thinkers, not being patronized in the last questions. But it's obvious when you think about it, in, in pure logical terms, you can't take something out of somewhere till you put it in there. <laughs> and you, if the government is the issuer of that which it collects for taxes, it, the private sector can't be, it's counterfeiting. You can't, the government can't take stuff out in taxes before it's put in. It's obvious you can't pour water out of a bucket as soon as being indoors and not in the rain. <laughs> so you pour it in. Yeah, I mean, it's not complicated. So the government has to spend first any taxes. I am explaining to my daughter, she's, you know, when she's about 13 or 14, she got that straight away because it's, and I mean, Common kids sense. always have a quote, doesn't she? If the difficulty lies not in accepting new ideas, but escaping from the old ones. And it's like you say, the old guys have got what they think is a system and they've, they've built their lives on it and they're not going to get rid of it. And I, I asked like, Randy Ray, I don't know if you've interviewed Randy, he's a phenomenal Aaron. scholar. Uh, I he's would got love a to. very slow drawl, and he, but he's very witty. And I said to Randy, well, when will the system change then, Randy? When, when will we get all these? New? And he speaks more slowly than me and he goes, when the old guys die. And it's a bit <laughs> gruesome, but it's true. You know, it, it, in a way, when these old guys, maybe I've died, but at least retired, and, you know, they're all gardening. Uh, fine. And the worst thing is when young people buy into all this right-wing libertarian dribble, th- then I get a little bit sad. 
because they want they should be when you're young, you want to make the world a better place, you want to challenge authority, you want to, you know, have something in you. And when they go, well, inflation's someone at the central bank printing more money, like you're joking. And one thing why it is so ridiculous is the clues in the word, isn't it? Central bank. Bankers are not known, are they, for profligacy? You know, your bank, a guy at a central bank well, is probably a guy that used to work in a bank. You know, he's not a guy who used to deliver milk, probably. And they do just turn up one day, roll up the sleeves and start printing more money just because, well, hey, let's be profligate. Or even if, and will the guys in government who want to get re-elected in, in a democracy suddenly ring up the central bank and go, right, lads, crank up the presses, you know, and what's quite interesting about hyperinflation is there is no record in history of any democratically elected government facing no external constraints ever having hyperinflation. It's all because of external constraints or, you know, crazy um, like zealots in charge who just do stupid things, you know. So even with all the mad governments we've had, We've never had hyperinflation in democracy with no external constraints. And I mean, never. So, you yeah. know, that tells um, us something. Well, I think a part of uh, the, the reason why anyone could even assume such a crazy thing that governments would just, you know, for no reason, just amp up, amp up the printing press and cause hyperinflation for no reason. Uh, to assume that one has to, of course, buy into a lot of ideology mm -hmm. And interestingly, yeah. I think it also derives the way people see the whole evolution of money, too, because yeah. I think a lot of the, the way a lot of people, a lot of the because um, I've, I've been very ex exploring the crypto community a lot recently. And there's mm. a lot of uh, I find it very fascinating, but there's unfortunately a lot of libertarians in there who are like former former gold bugs, basically. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they kind of, the way they see it is that they think there was always just commodity money and then it sort of evolved into fiat currency. Like they call it fake money. Whereas uh, actually the first money was credit. Yeah. <laughs> and, a, and it makes total sense. How can they just, where are they, where are they going to, where does the money originate? It doesn't make any sense. You know, they ha there has to, uh, an authority has to give it, issue it an IOU. And then, um, mm. you know, the public yeah, yeah. uses that. Right. So it, but the, the way yeah, that's the, not the how they see of it. The, the, of the, you know, this, you know, we go back to the thing about the history of money. If if people start, you know, when money was originally a commodity, like gold or something, and then later on governments came along and pirated it and credit followed it, then that makes a bit of sense. But, I mean, if you think about money as, like, in a private individuals created money in the form of gold. I mean, let's say as an example, say you take a few villages in, they never say where, you know, maybe 20 guys in a village and, you know, let's say they're all wandering around with a, a chicken in a basket trying to find a bloke who's got made some sandals that they need. And it's the right pain, so they have to swap it with a bloke who's got like, I don't know, a hat. And then they swap that. And they think, let's invent money and they use something. Well, they've got to find something to use. And then one of them one day, says to his mate, I've got a great idea. What's that? Why don't we use gold? So, oh, that's a great idea. Let's use gold. And then one the other one looks at the other guy and goes, uh, I've got a slight problem with that. Uh, where are we going to get it from? Because, I mean, it's not exactly lying around, is it, gold? You know, it's it's pretty tricky to get hold of, isn't it? You know, I mean, so the idea that they're all invented no? money from gold, where are they going to get the gold from? They're not where ordinary villages, all these individual entities, they're all going to get hold of this magical stuff, gold. You're joking. Obviously, gold is the preserve of the rulers, the government officials, the authorities who get the gold. And then they maybe decide at some point to put a little bit of gold in their coins, not not full value coins, obviously, just to give them a bit of status and to stop counterfeiting. You know mm. what I mean? And even under the gold standard, it was the state who would give gold the value by buying and selling it at a fixed rate. Private individuals hanging around can't get all the gold to make money out of. I mean, the whole idea is a joke. And, and as I said, the, the, what I think is really funny about the crypto gang 
it's not funny. It's, they're going about like libertarian this and you know, it's freedom and all that. Well, about eighty-seven percent of it, last I heard, uh, of it is produced in like Mongolia, where the really? electricity is cheap by a few <laughs> oligopolistic companies. So if that's free competition, I don't know. Uh, and also, it's so environmentally destructive making it. Uh, it's just a way of hiding your affairs from the government so that you can buy and sell drugs or you can buy and sell guns or things that are against public interest. Or you can just keep the government out of your business because you don't like the government. Or you can just get something like a Bitcoin, put your feet up, do nothing, and then hope the Bitcoin's worth more than it was a year ago. And then you can get more access to real goods and services that are being produced by hardworking other members of the community by doing nothing. So I wouldn't call it theft, but it's not too far away from that, is it? If you actually put it in those terms. So uh, Bitcoin, yeah, it, it's just it's just a, a speculative asset with a real value of zero. Uh, and you know, trying to hide activities from governments uh, pursuing public purpose is has got a long history. And mm. I know like in ancient times, well, hundreds of years ago in England, the king made it illegal for people to trade unless you use this currency. Because obviously he wanted to make sure that people would bring bullion to the king and I mean, not too much detail. You get a weight of bullion, then he would give you your coins back. But they would be only like 80% silver. And then that's how he gets his profit, his seniorage. If people are all just swapping silver, where's he getting his seniorage from? You know, what he wants yeah. to do is produce the silver into coins and then tax it back again to get most yeah. of the silver <laughs> back. I mean, so governments don't want people using other systems because it prevents that system we talked about, governments provisioning themselves. And in the UK, we have a health service. I'm a teacher. So I want to be provisioned by the state. If you're a libertarian, you don't want there to be a state, so you don't want it to be provisioned. Well, so therefore, if you can go around the system, it suits you. Great. You know, you just want to get a big gun and shoot anyone that comes near your property, as far as I can tell. To be fair, I wouldn't say that the libertarians don't want to say it's more that that's more like the anarcho-capitalists who are right, even, okay. even more delusional, if, if that was possible, yeah. being more delusional than a libertarian. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah, libertarian. I'm being a little bit provocative. But, but uh, I've been a bit unfair. Yeah. yeah. But my, my sort of theory is why libertarians uphold the gold standard is two reasons. I mean, I think one is more historical. And I think because despite liber just on the face of it, the gold standard is a completely stupid idea because it's not only <laughs> yeah, just yeah. it's unnecessarily limiting the, the resources yeah. of the government, like the spending capability. Yeah. But it's also incredibly just wasteful from a humanitarian point of view, yeah. because, I mean, the Spanish and Portuguese literally... Uh, went to Latin America and pillaged indigenous people to find more yeah. gold because they were running out of it for their stupid coins. Mm. So it, uh, it, uh, it's, it's incredibly <laughs> terrible, right? Yeah, yeah. But my theory is why, why they support, I think there's two reasons. One is more a class reason. I think, mm. uh, I think rich people like the idea of having their, uh, their, their bank accounts being backed up by something quote unquote real. And I think yeah, that's yeah. why after when FDR took the U.S. off the gold yeah. standard, right, when they were about to enter World War, I think it was after the great, the the stimulus policy, 1933, I believe, right? Uh, yeah. The coup, it, there was an assassination attempt on Roosevelt. There was a whole plot to assassinate mm. uh, Roosevelt over that. And um, I think there's a lot of rich people who hate that because, yeah, th th imagine all your, I mean, they have real estate, mm. they have companies, they have real wealth, but they want their abstract bank reserves to be backed up by something real. So I think part of it's super much, it's very much a class interest why they like the gold standard. They don't care about anyone else. And then there's yeah, a second yeah. one, which I think brings us sort of a little bit back to Weimar mm. is um, a lot of people think that you need a gold standard as this restraint to prevent hyperinflation. And that's why you have yeah. people like Jack Dorsey, Bitcoin CEO nerds mm. who say, mm. we're going to have hyperinflation uh, in the United States because we're on fiat. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, 
in a way, you, you, a lot of it goes back, you're absolutely right, to the trust in government. Now, a lot of these guys fundamentally don't trust government. I think they believe that everyone in government is just out for themselves. They don't trust them. You know, I don't want to caricature it too much. but And therefore, having a gold standard is a check on government activity. And that's what they, they can't help it. It's in their head. And so they like the idea of gold standard because it, if you like, restrains government activity. So the things that we would consider a ridiculous waste and constraining governments from pursuing public, but they think it's good because governments are unreliable. Now, this idea that fiat currency leads to hyperinflation, well, we've had fiat currency for years and years and years and years and years, and, years and I don't see any hyperinflation. And one of the problems with the pseudoscience element to all these sort of gold bugs and all these I'm not, libertarians or anarcho-capitalists. I like that phrase. They never give you a time. You know, like when the, you know, the Japanese have their massive debt to GDP ratio and they go, oh, well, I know the interest rates are rock bottom now and the government's completely solvent, but sometime, you know, it'll all crash. Yeah, and then it's like it's almost ago, religious. Like it's years like a ago. religious belief. Yeah, yeah. In Thirty market. years ago and forty years ago, and the, it's just around the corner, but the corner never comes. And so, yeah, they, they haven't got any evidence for it. It's profound distrust of government that's based on and fiat money. Well, fiat money, I mean, it's it's interesting, but like the Romans had effectively fiat money because they issued coins and nearly all of them were billion. They were just, they'd have some coins with a bit of silver in and some gold coins. But the basic stuff was just cheap metal. And people accepted it because the Roman fiscal system works. So you use Roman coins, you bought you pay the and tax. you paid your taxes. Yeah, and you paid your taxes and that underpinned it. And like in Britain, what's quite interesting is, if you say it was like 410, for example, when, you know, the Visigoths sacked Rome and the Roman soldiers were all on the way home to try and stop that happening, uh, you imagine you were a romanticised Britain and you've got a load of Roman coins uh, and they were made a billion, most of them, but you might have had a few silver ones. and Maybe an odd gold one that you probably wouldn't spend. It was probably semi, like a, a prize or something, but they're nearly all cheap stuff. So what you think is, ah, oh, well, the Romans have left, but they've always been here in, in living memory, and my granddad told me, and they've always been here, so they're bound to come back. So what I'll do is I'll put all my coins in a big pottery big pot and bury it in the ground about six foot and head for the hills in Wales. And then when the Romans have come back, I'll go and collect them because I can spend them again then and pay me taxes with them. And then, of course, the Romans didn't come back. So speed forward, you know, 2020, some guy with headphones like me and a metal detector finds the pot under the ground where they left it. Now, it, it's the confidence in the fiscal system that makes the coins valuable. Because obviously these guys wouldn't take their your billing coins to Wales with them. Would they? they can't spend them there. They'd leave them somewhere. You know, and it's obvious. But these right-wing guys just don't get it. It's people's confidence is money is founded upon the fact that they can be used to pay taxes, not what's in it. You know, the gold standard is just one little period of history. Nearly always through history, there was very little, if any, precious metal in coins. And things like tally sticks, which were just chunks of wood split in half, had no precious metal in it. They circulated as money in Britain in medieval times, and their value in sometimes as a nominal value is actually greater than the value of coins. So it's all a little bit crazy, you know, uh, but it is what it is, you know. It is what well, it is, as you know. That's what I, I think a lot of people have a hard time grasping is that 
with a fiat currency, what actually gives it its value if it's not back to a commodity? And well, the taxes, you need to pay it for taxes. People will accept that there's only two things certain in life, death and taxes, but yeah, they don't yeah. draw the connection that the taxes is what's upholding the the, the, the uh, yeah, yeah. value of the currency. Yeah. Because if you want to own a home, right, you got to pay property tax, among other yeah, things. Yeah. It's going to demand, uh, generate demand for that currency. Uh, people think that it's based on faith. You always hear that say it'll all come crashing down when people yeah. lose faith in the dollar. And it's not just it's not just libertarians who say this. I've actually heard some Marxists say that the end of mm. the, like America will yeah. have hyperinflation if its empire mm. ends. And Japan has the highest debt to GDP in the world. Its empire is virtually gone. Mm. They don't have a, a hyperinflation problem. They have a deflation problem, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that brings us to the next part, right, is you have a wonderful paper about what actually caused hyperinflation in Mm -hmm. Weimar Republic. What caused uh, hyperinflation in Weimar, Germany, and what ended it? What helped stop it? Long question, but take as much time as you like. Yeah, well, I'll just give you the sort of the history of the paper, if you like. What what happened was that I was very, because of the monetarists use Weimar as their kind of go-to case, won't you? You know, it's, oh, well, look at Weimar. That's an example of governments printing too much money. You know, the Weimar government printed a lot of money, banknotes, pictures of very high-value banknotes, and this caused higher inflation. So whenever the government spends money or QE or something, they just make up QE isn't about printing money, but they, they, they love to use the go to Weimar. It's all the same. So I thought, well, what I'd like to do is analyze Weimar and the actual historical events of Weimar and more importantly, the sequence that they happened to prove that the narrative of monetarists that increase in money supply leads to increase in price level is the wrong chronology. So I did a lot of research on it. You know, I'm not a Weimar scholar, I'm not a historian. So I wrote all this about Weimar. And then I'm thinking, right, in the world, who knows most about the mechanics of the price level? Now, you can guess what I'm going to say, Mr. Mosler. So I sent him my research, and I said, what do you think about that, Warren? Uh, and he and he had a twisty arm a little bit, but he got into it. Now, what I, I'm a bit different to Warren as much as I write too much. Uh, Warren is very sharp in what he wants to say. So he's... He got interested in it. He said, can I edit it? Because Warren humorously calls what I sent him a Weimar information pack. So I sent him loads of stuff <laughs> about Weimar. I mean, it's monstrously big. He cut that half of it out. He was very polite about it. Because what he wanted to do with the paper, and he's absolutely right, is use it as a vehicle to explain the dynamics of the price level. Now, uh, I'm hoping that some other MMT scholars, possibly, you know, other and, and Weimar hysterians. In fact, what, Warren and I are both hoping that, that this paper we wrote will be taken up and developed by real historians, you know what I mean? But essentially the dynamic of the um, uh, Weimar story is that it was an increase in the quantity of money that caused the inflation. This was actually well known in Germany at the time. What actually happened was that the Germans, there's lots of factors involved in it, but the primary fact, the Germans were required to pay reparations. Uh, And the reparations mechanism involved very high taxation on Germans, which is payable in their own currency, you know, the paper mark. And that was delivered to the agent general. And the agent general then would then sell German currency on exchange markets, exchange for gold or the currencies of the countries. Now, in principle, if you imagine an imaginary mechanism, what would happen is say the Germans... I'm just pick a figure. Say you impose 20% more tax on the Germans, they can't and withdraw that money. 20% of the resources they were buying are now available for export. So those goods could have been sold to foreign countries. Foreign countries would then 
offer their, you know, dollars or whatever it is to buy it. So when the agent general that I've just said offers to give them the paper marks, then, of course, the exchange rate isn't a problem. But what actually happens, if you imagine Germany, their people are already in starvation level. Is it possible to reduce the starving population's living standards still further and not have your government overthrown? I think not. So what really happened was that the that when the exchange when when these trades of marks were being made on the market, plus speculation as well adds to it, the value of the mark absolutely crashed and that was the trigger so the trigger of hyperinflation was a falling value of the mark and its primary cause was reparations imposed on an economy that couldn't pay now once if you imagine the exchange rate falls the price of imports goes up domestic prices go up now at the time Labour power was quite high. So in other words, you've got an administrative price that you're paying, that you you can charge for your product. You've agreed to pay your workers higher wages. But in order for that to happen, the, 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 if you like, the Reichsbank has to print the value of the currency to allow the economy to operate at that price level. So that's your chronology. Falling exchange rate. Yeah, rising you... prices, printing the money to allow that to happen. And if you look mm. at the chronology, it's very, very clear. I mean, Helfrich at the time, who was the leading German economist, the story only makes sense in that order. Now, you might argue, OK, right, some monetarists, are, well, ah, yeah, but it was still the government printing money. Yeah, but OK, then. So he, So the price level is now much higher. Does the central bank refuse to issue the money and no one can go to work now? Nobody can buy anything you, because the price level can't be. You see what I mean? So you're really asking someone to crash the economy altogether or, you know, and that's the option or print the money that's required to operate at the current price level. And, and they obviously were forced to choose the latter because these guys are patriots. You know, Havenstein, who's the chairman of the Reichsbank, he's a banker. He hated printing more money, but he had to do it. Otherwise, the economy would crash. And what's quite interesting, and, and I point this out, he constantly apologised to people for his inability to keep up printing money fast enough to keep right. up with the price yeah. level. Now, if it was the other way around, why would he do that? That's why he had to gain unlicensed printers and accept this sort of note gel. Now, that's the, the mechanism. It was the reparations were unpayable, the crash of the exchange rate fueled by speculation and the agent general selling Plus the fact the government then raised the interest rate to like 900%. So you're just giving more and more money in paper marks, which could then be transferred speculatively and driving the currency down. So you have to get the currency correct and it fed on itself. Now, if you imagine we've already got massive, massive inflation and then because the Germans couldn't pay, the French and the Belgians invaded the Ruhr. The German government continued to pay their workers because it was part of unity and political in Germany, but they weren't producing anything. So you've got more demand uh, at, at, at higher prices, point? more speculation, hyperinflation. But you have to get the idea that the chronology is right and it's the crash of the exchange rate leading to higher import prices, higher prices, and reluctantly the Reichsbank agreeing to print the quantity of money required for the, for the uh, economy to operate. And, um, and one thing is very interesting, 
despite the avalanche, as they call it, banknotes, the real money supply in Weimar, Germany was scarce. I know that's an incredible thing to say, but it's true. So if you actually looked at the price level compared to the quantity of money, <laughs> there wasn't, still wasn't enough. Yeah, they had to get other people to like counterfeit money, basically. Yeah, because it could never happen, but they had yeah. to do it. And, and so this idea that Easy. Hammerstein turned up at the central bank and said, right, we're going to print a load of money, lads, because we just want to crash the system. It's just totally does not fit with historical events at all. And, and then the answer becomes, well, how did they get out of it then? And they got out of it quite quickly. I mean, they were out of it in 924. It's that's when Schacht came in. Now, if you've got an illness, you want to look at the actual primary cause of the illness. You know, so if a guy's got malaria, he can't just calm his, you know, temperature down. You've got to give him tablets to get rid of the malaria, assuming it works in that order. You know, apologies for my lack of medical knowledge. Now, he knew that the Reichsbank extending credit was a problem, which spec through its speculation, but he also knew that the problem was with um, the reparations. So he got a moratorium on reparations, he took back control of the banking system, and then he got rid of hyperinflation pretty simply. So he just basically got rid of the primary problem, which was the crash of the value of the mark. And he did that, some of it's apocryphal, by sitting in his office and making a load of phone calls to central bankers. Fortunately, he had telephones in the 1920s. And I think he maybe had a meeting or two, but very few. He put the price in place. Because something still, like, I still, I'm still kind of confused by that, though. Is Wouldn't Germany have to, in order to um, fix the hyperinflation, it would have to, one, fix part of their productive capacity which was sort of decimated by i don't know not only world war one but the treaty of versailles and also later uh, the the french and belgians invading um and taking over factories but also the fact that they had to pay in what is it three different currencies and they had yeah. also buy gold to pay uh mm. the british and the french uh i don't i still don't see how they could stop hyperinflation without addressing those core roots. Well, costs. they did that by, I mean, I haven't got the paper in front of me. They, they borrowed 800 million in gold. Mm -hmm. Now that enabled them to get a stopgap to rebuild their economy. Now, he, the problem for the Allies was, and it's particularly true with the British, is that if you're going to get any, any reparations out of a conquered enemy, if you think about it, if you can't really get anything out of someone that's destroyed, you know, if you've got like a, a, a guy who's your enemy and, you know, say, it's, I don't say he's a hunter. If you break both his legs, you, he can't really go out and catch you any deer to eat. Now, at the end of the day, there was a lot of cynicism and still exists now that Ger the Germans were hiding. You know, they could really pay, you know, they could produce enough stuff to sell to other countries to get the gold or foreign currency to make the reparations. Now, it's that sort of view that underpins the invasion of the Ruhr when the Germans are saying, look, we physically haven't got the stuff. And in a way, it doesn't matter whether the physical stuff is sent abroad or the Germans sell physical stuff for gold or foreign currencies to give. It, the German argument was they were unable to make the reparations because it was politically impossible. They were too poor. They hadn't got the real resources. Now, what Schacht got was a moratorium. He got an 800 million gold loan, which enabled him and a, a re-staggering. And then, obviously, at that point, he cut off speculation. The Allies weren't you know, trying to sell loads of paper marks. So he was able to stop the, cat the, the catastrophic fall in the value of the mark and obviously invented a new mark, the Renton mark, which people weren't allowed to give to foreigners, which again prevented its exchange rate falling. So what he did was he essentially stopped the fall of the mark 
by halting speculation, withdrawing the note gel, and most importantly, prevent uh, putting a check on it. Now, once you can control the value of the mark externally, then obviously the dynamic, which was driving up prices, starts to fall. And then you don't need to keep printing loads of money because you've prevented the price level going up. Now, so if you imagine the narrative, the cause, the primary cause of hyperinflation is, is the fall in the value of the mark, causing price to rise, meaning there's a need to print more currency. If you can prevent the fall in the value of the mark, which Shaq did by getting this moratorium, getting controls of speculation, et cetera, then you would give, bring, reduce the value, uh, reduce the price level increase, and then you don't need to print the currency. You've got a new one, the rent mark, you're back to stability, monetary stability. Now, obviously, after that, you've still got, as you say, the real resource problems. So, you know, the Germany is still quite a depressed economy. And so it relied on a lot of U.S. credit coming in. The reason where the Amer Americans was, were lending Ger Germany funding, which basically recirculated back to the Allies in reparations, and so there's a sort of circulative flow from through the 20s. And then, of course, after Wall Street crashed, that the flow of credit to Germany stopped. The economy crashed. And then, obviously, you got Hitler arriving. But I didn't go that far in my history. So, I, But that's the, the essential dynamic of Weimar. Um, and obviously, it's a complex story all of the historical details. And that's why, as I say, Warren and I are not in any way pretending to be experts in Weimar history. But what we are showing, I hope, very clearly, very clearly is that the sequence of events was not from, you know, Reichsbank prints a load of banknotes, value of the ex exchange rate crashes, Price level goes up. That was wrong. It was reparations, speculation, which didn't involve printing the money initially. Was there all deals that were made? All right. Uh, value of the mark crashes. Okay. Uh, then you get the inflation. Then you get the money printing, and you can only solve hyperinflation by dealing with the initial causes, which was the crash in the currency. That's all we really, that's all we really wanted to do uh, with that paper. Uh, well, in terms of Weimar, anyway, there was another point that Warren wanted to stress, if that makes right. sense. So, sort of like, um, sort of summed up kind of by in the paper when you say, uh, we identify the rise in the quantity of money and the printing of increasing quantities of banknotes as a consequence of hyperinflation rather than its cause. Um, yes. And I, I noticed there tends to be a trend with hyper when it comes to hyperinflation in most the, in the most dramatic causes, mm -hmm. uh, places like uh, Weimar Germany, but as mm -hmm. well as places like uh, Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. Venezuela are often mm -hmm. brought up. Mm -hmm. They tend to usually germinate from something in the real economy. Like yeah. uh, Bill Mitchell yeah. talks a lot about Zimbabwe and what sort yeah. of caused that to happen, uh, kind of a huge decline in their productive capacity. Mm. And while the demand was still increasing, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. And in Venezuela, though, I'm not as sure. I know Venezuela, a lot has to do with sanctions, I think uh, really hurting their productive capacity and but they're capable yeah. of importing as well. And I think, yeah, I think they also have a lot of foreign yeah. debts, but I'm not as yeah. sure about that. Well, in simple terms of Venezuela, I mean, again, I'm not historically, but if you imagine Venezuela in the latter part, I mean, I can't give you the exact dates, but pre-Chavez was one of the poorest countries in uh, South America because it's not got a lot of natural resources. Well, well I mean, it, not, it was rich. Oil. Oil. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was oil, rich, but right. it was uh, owned by a few companies, right? Yeah, and 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 it's not got very good agricultural land. Yeah, so it was. Yeah. If you look at it, it's poorer than places like Colombia and a lot of good. Now, yes. what happened was, of course, Venezuela then started to export oil, and the oil price went up. So you can imagine now that somebody like Chavez comes in, and I'm not 
saying he's a great guy or anything, but if you think about what Chavez was able to do or the, the Venezuelans were able to do at that time, if you imagine they can sell a lot in simple terms, they can sell a load of oil and acquire foreign currency for that oil, say US dollars. Yeah. Now, with the US dollars, then they can buy lots of real stuff, yeah, yeah, which can fill their shops. But so it makes them dependent, can, right? Yeah. So then they can pay their own community in Venezuelan currency, who can then buy all the Venice, all the stuff that's being bought. Now that's their economy, and it worked well. And if you look at the prosperity of Venezuela, it became one of the most prosperous countries in South America. Yeah, I think Amazing. it had one of the biggest poverty reductions in all yeah, of Latin America. And Nick, welfare I think the, the, the only country to surpass Venezuela in the poverty reduction in Latin America was uh, uh, Bolivia, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, if you then fast forward a bit to, and I can't give it the date, when the crisis started, basically you had a massive crash in the oil price. And also the sanctions imposed by America, which prevented Venezuela selling oil properly anyway. You know, Trump was doing a lot of stuff with, I don't know the details, nationalizing or trying to prevent Venezuela selling oil through America. Sanctions. Now you've got a problem with Venezuela because it, it's now still paying its people Venezuelan currency. But the stuff it used to rely to bring into the country... It can't do. Yeah, now, you so could blame the government, stuff, but the right. real cause of it is, one, something outside of its control, which is to fall in the value of oil. But the real reason, the fundamental core reason, was sanctions placed upon it. And it's no surprise, because as you know, the Americans don't like Venezuela being a success, and they certainly don't like the, the country it supported very highly being a success Cuba. So they yes. wanted to bring them down. And it's and the sanctions were a very good way of doing it. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that Venezuela is a perfect country, that it's you know human rights is great, etc. I'm not saying better that, than an American but, puppet state. That's where I'll yeah. Say. So at the end of the day, to say that it was like a failure of socialism. Well, oh, it's not even true, social. Why did they do so not brilliantly socialist. before <laughs> then? Why, why did they, as you say, reduce poverty so much? The, the primary cause right, right. was yeah. U.S. sanctions. In the same way, you know, with Weimar, in price of oil, the primary uh, cause crash was too, no? the crash currency. So, you know what I mean? It's These stories are necessarily complicated. And if you want to interpret them in particular ways, you know, you, you, you can do that. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I like my story of Venezuela, you know, I, I it's there's a lot. It's very difficult for any country that's dependent on imports uh, that yeah. has to buy with a foreign currency to then be yeah. hit by sanctions. Right. Because if yeah. let's say Mexico was hit with sanctions, mm -hmm. they they stack a lot of their shelves with American goods. So mm -hmm. they would they would be screwed like Venezuela, uh, probably, yeah. maybe even worse. Uh, if they had something like that happen to them. So, you know, they'll, they'll say failure of socialism. I always find that funny because I look at Venezuela more sort of like a social democracy, if one wants to call yeah. it that. But um, interestingly, when Venezuela was, was a success, there was a Fox News article that said, Venezuela is not socialist. Don't call it a success of socialism. <laughs> socialism. Yes, this, was, yes. this was in about, I think, I think 2010, that article came out. Then uh, 2000, 2017, they have an article saying Venezuela proves that socialism doesn't work. And they put Ocasio-Cortez in the front cover, you know, <laughs> typically. So, yeah. yeah, we can see their no motives. No surprise there, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've um, interviewed Fadel Kaboop, but... Um, I haven't. I haven't, even, would... I haven't interviewed any uh, MMT people yet, except you now. You're the first. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. Well, it's a privilege to be first on. I mean, I think Fidel, well, they're all great, but Fidel would be fantastic because he does a lot of work with third world countries and, you know, developing countries and about the global divide. And, you know, I think it, he'd be very, very interesting man to talk to. But, I mean, obviously... If a country can be economically self-sufficient, like not rely on too much upon trade of goods, be open culturally and other, you know, uh, in terms of travel, you know, 
global warming, climate change accepted, but to cultures and, and to accept people. But if you can, the more you can produce yourself, the better you are, you know, produce what you can and trade for the rest, you know? Uh, now, sometimes that's practically impossible. You know, if you're living in a, a sub-Saharan country where it's very, very difficult producing a food and stuff, you know, you would need multilateral aid, but it's very difficult for countries who are rely who are poorer nations who are relying on that system, you know, and, and Fadel is a real MMT expert on this issue. But um, yeah, uh, the the other thing I might mention uh, about the Weimar paper is, and you may have, the the fundamental point that, that Warren likes to stress is that the price level is fundamentally determined, like at its core, by the prices paid by the state. And it's much more about the prices paid rather than the quantity per se. So, you know, if the government keeps buying something at a certain level, the price level will remain at that level. And obviously, if the government decides to decides to compete with the private sector by paying higher prices, it's going to and continually doing so that will generate inflation, you know, so. And then if you like the whole private oligopolistic structure sits on top of that fundamental process. And it has to be true logically because the government issues the currency and therefore it's a monopoly and it can set the price of the currency, which is the inverse of the price level of goods and services. So as a matter of logic, you know, it's the prices paid by the state that fundamentally determine the price level and by definition, the potential for inflation rather than the quantity of money it's spending per se. And that yeah. is a vital insight of MMT where it stands in contrast to sort of orthodox classical dichotomy, monetarists, et cetera, you know? And I think the, there was a work, a paper done by Sam Levy on this point that you, you, uh, on that this monopoly pricing and linking it into all got this very interesting paper on levy which you may be able to link into your podcast for people who are interested in the technical mm. so that whole you know that cost push you know markup structure oligopoly structure the if you like the institutional structure sits on top of that but fundamentally, the government's pricing structure, that it, that it buys labour in particular, anything else, as the fundamental determinant of the system. Right, right. Uh, I would like you to elaborate for a moment on the prices paid by the government. Uh, just mm -hmm. elaborate what, what that looks like and what that means, because that might not be clear to uh, the audience. Well, I mean, just, I mean, Warren used an example of soldiers, but, you know, let, let's let's uh, let's say nurses, in, say uh I don't know what a nurse gets, but uh, say uh, it, it, using British currency, say the government buys nurses at £25,000 annually. If it keeps on buying nurses at 25000 annually, then that will leave the price level the same. And if it does the same for everything it buys, that the price level remains the same. Now, if, for example, there's a shortage in the community, and say, for example, I don't know, um, the private sector starts trying to compete with the government and paying more and more and more wages to attract nurses out. The government's really got a choice. It could raise its price to 30. So the government now starts paying more. And if it keeps on doing that, the government's offering more in competition with the private sector, then you would get inflationary pressure. If on the other hand, the government held firm, and said, no, we are, we're not raising our prices. Initially, what would happen is that all the workers would be trying to work in the private sector. But the problem would be is that people would run out of state money to pay their taxes. And eventually, right. when there was insufficient in the economy, people would have to move out of these private sector jobs and come back working for the government. So what I'm really saying is because the government's unique in that it can demand its own money back in taxes, it remains 
fundamentally the determinant. Now, the government may decide, of course, that it wants to compete. You know, it has to compete politically and it may keep raising prices, the price it pays for resources in competition with the private sector, particularly if it's not aware of what it's doing. But it's the prices the government pays for everything that fundamentally determine the price level. Uh, and, and I mean, to give you an extreme example, if the government say there was only one commodity and the government paid a certain amount of money for it, uh, and then the private sector wanted to pay more, initially everybody, you know, um, private sector would buy all the resources, but then nobody have any money to pay the taxes, so they'd have to go to the government. So I'm not saying that the economy works simply. The economy is complicated. Uh, and there was a very interesting article which you may want to link to the podcast. Uh, it's an MM, uh, FF Financial Times Alphaville article, uh, MMT on inflation. So that's the fundamental point that if the government holds its prices at the same, it will pr pr uh, naturally prevent inflation and pressure generating. And if it competes with the private sector, it will, if there's already uh, inflation and pressure developing, then it would help, you know, it would uh, fuel that. But having said that, I think most of the inflation that we're seeing currently, I would say, is this oligopoly sorts of structures or, for example, markets allocating resources? And a lot of expectation time of future shortages, too, right? Yeah, because yeah. The and expectation a lot of, that isn't of true inflation in the sense it's not, it, you get a jump in an index. Is this price increases? Yeah. Uh, what I think is quite interesting, you may be seeing this in America and, and, and Canada because people, rich people, are really worried about their money. They mm -hmm. might, you know, that whatever the, the index is, it might say the index is running at maybe showing 2% rise. It maybe goes up to four and they all panic about the inflation. And so we've got to do things about it. Normally exactly the wrong thing, which is raising interest rates because given it's short. Yeah, I was going to ask positive. you about that actually later because yeah. the interest rates yeah. I find a really fascinating yeah, understood phenomenon. And then, and the, yeah, and, and then, but what happens is that the price level the, the, the increase in price level drops back down again the next month. So it wasn't really sustained inflation off, as we've seen at the beginning, building up on itself. It was actually just a one-off jump in the price level, which isn't sustained and self-generating. And it's mainly because they, if you imagine, and it makes sense if you're rich and you're a bank and you've got a lot of money, you want you want to protect the value of money. And the way to do that is to increase your interest rate, because if you do that, you'll get a bigger return on your money. You know, so if inflation is 4%, your interest rate is 4%, then you haven't lost anything. And if it's 5%, you've got to gain, haven't you? But the key point is to argue that raising interest rates as they do is actually the way to deal with inflation is wrong. It's the wrong way around. Because if you think about it, uh, as Warren says, if you've got a very large debt to GDP ratio, if you increase the interest rate by, say, 1%, you're, the, the state's a net payer and it's keying money into the system. It's now giving the private sector 1% more income, which is going to fuel price rises and a potential for more spending. Uh, and it's spending that causes inflation. So if you, and if you think about it, the higher, in, the higher interest rate of 1%, it might reduce borrowing, but not very much because at the end of the day, borrowing levels are highly insensitive to interest rate changes. You know, like in, Japan's got virtually zero in bank lending. Yeah, they you can't know. even get out of deflation. Yeah, so the idea that you put the interest rate up, you know, half a percent would be good for inflation. Well, it will be bad for inflation, giving the private sector more income. The effect on bank lending, if anything, will be minimal. So it won't do anything. So you've got no chance. And, yeah. and as Warren says, for every pat, for every in the back, all you do is expand banks. So you've got more loan. Even if you had less loans, then both sides of the balance sheet go down for every pound of deposits there's a pound of assets for every pound of borrowing you're a pound of saving and so 
it's just a matter of you're giving it savers more money and you're taking a bit more off borrowers and you're relying on borrowers, borrowers perhaps reacting more by spending less to a greater extent, if you like, than savers borrow more. Now, that may be spend more, but that fact's not really that big. And for Warren, I think it's Warren that points that out. And I think he's absolutely right that certainly in a normal range of interest rates, putting the risk, putting the risk-free interest rate up is in fact inflationary, not contractionary. So not only are central bankers wrong to say that interest rates are the right way to deal with inflation, even more fundamentally and quite humorously and ironically, they've got it the wrong way round. You actually segued right into my next question because it's super obviously related to inflation because often um, when it comes to inflation, a lot of neoclassicals like to attribute this the reduction in inflation after the 1970s that proceeded into the 80s to uh, Chairman Paul Volcker under uh, Ronald Reagan for raising interest rates super duper high and they attribute that to reducing inflation. Now, whenever there's inflation now, you always see people in like the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, they'll say, oh, will interest rates rise? And it's like, how is that going to reduce inflation? I mean, it makes sense if you assume that it's directly related to the quantity of money, because obviously they'll say that infl- the raising the interest rates will, you know, make bar- will lessen borrowing, so it'll reduce the amount of money. And maybe I could see it uh, reducing inflation in like the stock market in the real estate mm. market, perhaps, but um, not necessarily anywhere else. Yeah. Um, it, it's but it's interesting because it's a lot of things people assume. I think people, a lot of hitter, uh, orthodox economists would, their brain would explode just by you saying that that it, they have it. The oh other yeah, way I around. mean it's it's well, so hard. What, and, and- and Warren mentions that many of the other MMT advocates don't stress this point because it's a bit too out there. I mean, but but, but, but it's I mean, also at the hard end to... of the day, it, 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 a lot of it's got to do with the debt to GDP ratios because you could argue that if you put interest rates up without any, you know, if there was no government debt, then obviously you, you would you would be giving savers more money, wouldn't you? And you would you would be giving um, well, borrowers, is it- you would be hitting yeah. So you, and borrowers would would now be a bit poorer, and there'd be fewer loans made. So although your savers have got more money because you put the interest rate up, you might argue, well, that's an expansionary force, isn't it? That the savers have now got more money because you've raised interest rates, but you've reduced the stock, the, the amount of borrowing by reducing, you know, by raising interest rates so people won't want to borrow as much. And as you say, there'll be less money created and borrowers will be poorer. Now, I can see that you might argue with no, with a zero debt ratio or a low debt ratio, you might think, well, the contractionary effect of a higher interest rate in those circumstances outweighs the expansionary. But the problem is when you've got like, Debt to GDP P ratios of 100% or more, this is a massive force that dwarfs that. You know, it's so much bigger that the difference in the MPCs between borrowers and savers and the effect of possibly marginally reducing borrowing is drowned by the fact that if you've got a huge amount of government debt outstanding and you're now giving them everybody another half percent more by keying it into the system, whoa, that's a much bigger fact. Well, so it's I, like I, a tsunami. And they haven't taken that into account. They've not thought about that factor. They're just thinking about, like you said, lower, you know, higher interest rates, less borrowing, less spending. But there's another factor, the elephant in the room, the debt to GDP ratio. And that swamps it. It's a bigger effect, you know. And and if you're looking for empirical estimates, that's what you know. Warren obviously uh, he, he sees all this and he, he's waiting for. An, and I'll put that out there. An MMT scholar to try and work on it. But uh, you, you know, you can get things like look at Japan. I mean, if low interest rates were inflationary, well, why is Japan with the rock bottom interest rates? Why is it not inflating it? 
a rapid pace. It, it ain't. I mean, it's had low interest rates for years and had no inflation for years. Well, so, uh, I think um, you know, Warren Law always says that, right, um, high interest rates is basically basic income for rich people. Yeah. And I think right. part, part of to that is is because it's usually people with more money who one can buy a lot of bonds and also two mm -hmm. uh, get a high return from those bonds. Yeah. And I think I can I can totally see how high interest rates wouldn't reduce inflation, but mm -hmm. the idea that they would make it worse is a bit confusing because while it is in, it, it's really just swapping money from different accounts essentially right from uh, people who are usually borrowing under lower interest rates to people who are uh, you know bond holders or lenders etc mm -hmm. but the people usually rich people who benefit from the high interest rates more they don't tend to spend that extra money like regular people do they tend to often hoard that money so if anything wouldn't it just lead to just a worse economy well, I mean, it's quite interesting, but let's, if, if say you had a bond that paid, I don't know, 5%, and then the interest rate goes up, so now you've got 6%. So the government is effectively creating, well, well like this, the government's effectively via its central bank is keying in more money, like, because it's a currency issue. So now rich people have got more money agreed to spend. Now, even if they hoard it, they might buy like all the financial assets for that, but then that's going to raise their prices and the person who bought it off has now got the money. So there's more money in circulation. Now, I accept the fact that they have got a, a lower NPC, the rich people, than poor people. But I just explain that for a moment. What's an NPC? Because lots uh, of, there's also a meme. Consume. <laughs> so if you give someone a unit of money, right, right, a right, portion right. of that are they going to spend? Now, rich people, as you say, will spend a lower proportion of additional income than poor people. But given debt to income ratios are so huge, this net injection of money, which is just a data entry of money to people who own debt, is going to increase the quantity of potential spending power in the economy isn't it significantly and that's why it can potentially be inflationary um, um yeah I mean? so so it would, certainly would, won't would be the contractionary why would people giving people tons more free money how how could that possibly be you know deflationary well, and also the, the thing that puzzles me too is because if if the strategy of having high interest rates under you know under Reagan to re to reduce inflation, if that was the goal of reducing inflation, then why did Reagan also cut taxes so much? That's that's also the paradox because he cut taxes so much. Actually, ran I think I believe still to this day Reagan might have been surpassed by Trump, but I think Reagan yeah. ran the highest increase in the debt to GDP in history. In American history. Yeah. So yeah. if that was their goal, that doesn't make any sense. Because if they wanted to reduce inflation, they they wouldn't reduce taxes. Yeah, I'm, it, it, a lot. I mean, it's quite interesting. There's, there's all those things in tension, isn't there? I, I think that they what they want to do is reduce taxes because it's ideologically the commitment their voters expect it. And actually, number one, and they will argue, won't they, that reducing taxes will somehow create more incentives to work you get more output you know the old um laffer curve stuff and and and, and i love so to laugh at the laffer curve you gotta laugh at the laffer curve <laughs> uh, and and uh, but none of these things are actually particularly inherently consistent i mean i and i and even and what i think is quite interesting is let's be generous for a moment and say that inflation might be reduced say they're right all right so let's say all right you're raising interest rates uh might would reduce borrowing and therefore might reduce inflation when inflation's due to people spending too much all right well that's wrong but even if it was right given it what about it most inflation's cost push because there's a shortage of materials or you know the oil import supplies have increased the price of oil. So how how will making you know borrowers poorer help to deal with that? I mean, 
It won't deal with the direct cause, which is a shortage of materials. Or, you know, wouldn't it be better to say maybe have buffer stocks of materials or to encourage output of products you think might be in short supply in your own country surely that's a better way of dealing with these supply side shocks than just making your customers poorer it's you know what i mean it's a very old way of dealing with things you know i hear yeah, an it's auction, incredibly the price going up because she didn't didn't have enough stuff you say oh what i'm going to do is not try and get more stuff but just make all my customers poorer so they can't buy anymore buy it at the i mean yeah, and that's the high works. unemployment that resulted from the, uh, yeah. the the high interest rates because of all the small businesses that crash because they can't yeah. afford to borrow as much and whatnot. So yeah. it, it, it makes sense why Warren says that it actually it prolonged the inflation as in in the in the eighties as opposed yeah. to yeah. stopping it. Yeah. Now the the, yeah. the only rationale I can think of as to why they would justify such contradictory policies is because. If, again, redistributing money to the rich because you have the tax cuts that disproportionately benefited the rich. You had the privatizations mm -hmm. and yeah. also right the high interest rates effectively free money from the rich for the rich. Yeah. You know, because it's like I, I think interest rates in the U.S. peaked at what, 21 percent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. No, and yet That's a lot of money right, for risk free assets. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, whether they would people doing it would see it in those terms i don't know but for my part i think you're absolutely right what you say i find you know spot on it's just a way of redistributing wealth from, rich, from the poor to the rich uh, and the rich ain't going to be unhappy about that and they're going to say thanks very much you know uh, and they're going to come up with some spurious reason for saying why it's supposed to work um and i think even if rich elites suspected that higher interest rates were not, in fact, the way to deal with inflation. They would still want them, and they would use that as a reason for advocating because they've got a lot of money and they want the value of their money to be protected. And this gives them a reason for saying that. So I, I'm not suggesting yeah. they know, but even if they did, it would be knowledge they would like or want to propagate, you know? Uh, imagine a right wing guy who's rich, hanging around with all his mates saying, look, what we really need to do is cut interest rates to reduce inflation. Uh, I know maybe our money won't go up. And the, I think he'd be drummed out of the gentleman's club, wouldn't he? You know, he wouldn't be sitting on that leather chair with that 25 year old whiskey in much longer, you know? Yeah, I think a great a great quote that I always that always comes to my head when it comes to phenomena like this is. Um, for every complex problem, there is an extremely straightforward answer that is wrong. H.L. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Minkin. H. Yeah, L. Minkin. I, I yeah. think that's right. And, and, and um, the, yeah. So, so we we talked about uh, interest rates. Now, this kind of brings me to the last question I wanted to ask you, and that's about exchange rates and the relationship yeah. between exchange rates and inflation. Because yeah. when you were talking about Weimar, you mentioned how. They had to buy gold and then to you know, essentially to buy different mm. currencies so that they to pay these reparations, mm. it hurt their exchange rate. Mm. Now, what is the relationship between the exchange rate, exchange rate and inflation? Because this is something I think that has there's a lot of confusion around because some people, I think, see them a little more directly correlated than they actually are. Like, for example, I went to Japan a couple of years ago and 10 Canadian dollars gets me 100 yen. Does mm. that mean there's inflation in japan no because prices overall in japan decreasing not increasing so yeah. what actually is the relationship between inflation and and interest exchange rates in a sense if the exchange rate drops then the price of imports will will go up because you have to pay more of your currency to get that and then if it's raw materials that'll maybe fuel internal inflation and obviously it feeds on a bit because if you've got inflation people might not want to hold your currency so they'll sell your currency which will drive it down fuel rep more inflation now in the case of weimar germany he had to import huge amounts of stuff plus the fact it's got the agent general selling loads of its currency. So obviously it's very affected by the exchange rate. Now, what's quite interesting is what people suggest is, well, you know, 
if you did policies like full employment policies, all the you know the foreign exchange market traders would all sort of sell your currency in a mass panic, and it would drive it down, and then you get inflation because you know the price level would go up because all your imports are now much more expensive. Now the problem with that is is most modern economies, certainly something like the US or the UK, the so-called pass-through is far, far less. So in other words, if the value of the dollar drops a bit or the US dollar or the pound drops a bit, the effect on domestic inflation rates is, is pretty small. And also, if you are running an economy efficiently, so say you, you know, you can, as we've said, you can't implement MMT. If you say you had a job guarantee, you had efficient infrastructure, people were fully employed, you know, you had a sensible government in charge that knew what they were doing. Foreign exchange dealers are not ideologues. So once the current, once they started selling, the currency goes down a bit, your exports become more competitive, so you start selling more. And also the ideologues will start, so the, the exchange rate, uh, exchange traders will be thinking, Ooh, I think we made a mistake here. This is, this is a cracking economy, and I think they'll start buying it. So my opinion is that if there were... MMT became the expected, you know, the accepted theory and policies like the job guarantee were introduced based upon that theory. The main problem, I think, would be an appreciating rate. Now, I don't know that for sure, of course, because I'm being over optimistic. But if, for example, if, for example, uh, currency speculators did start selling your currency, and it did drive it down, it did cause inflation, then you could just put exchange controls on. It is banned prevent speculation. speculation. Sorry? Is it possible to ban speculation? Yeah, you, you, you would basically say, right, if you're doing a trade and you've got a documented import, you have the paperwork to say so, then you, you've got access to markets. If you're doing a, a hedge on trade, you would have information to take. So if you're going on holiday, you know, you would have the paperwork to say so. If you were buying currency, you know, in big amounts in order to sell, then you would have a rule where you're not allowed to do it. You know, you can't buy money and sell it very quickly. Can't do it. It's not done. Now, bearing in mind that, like, it, every bank transaction links to a central bank, and we could have exchange controls like years ago, we can easily do that now. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should you know I don't think but could we do it of course we could you know i mean what what's to stop people doing that you know i don't think there's a problem and, and in many ways if is currency speculation a valuable activity is it how is, is it a, yeah what is the purpose of it other than yeah so uh, i just regulate it out of existence say it's illegal mm -hmm. So in other words, people are not allowed to buy and sell currencies with the only purpose of increasing the value that higher than what they started with. They have no evidence at all of any real transaction, any buying and selling, any hedging associated with that or anything of that nature. Now, you'd have to draw up the rules. It could be done, but it's all electronic. You know, I mean, every every transaction is it checked, you know, you have like, you know, constant rules like, you know, you can't transfer in Britain, you can't move money out of one bank account to another if you're an ordinary person more, for more than £10,000 a day. So if you want to repay your mortgage, you got to do it over several days, you know. So there's loads of banking rules, tons of them. Didn't uh, you know? certain billionaires like George Soros make a lot of money off of speculating on the British yeah, pound? Yeah, and yeah. Didn't, didn't it cause like a drop? In the pound because of his he did yeah yeah and, and that was because we had a fixed exchange rate system right uh, okay and, and and the thing about that is why fixed exchange rates are bad is uh with a fixed exchange rate it has to be credible that you can manage it so obviously britain tried to fix against deutschmark because pre-euro as i remember two deutschmarks 95 with a some tolerance limit uh and soros knew that the Bank of England couldn't do that. And so when people started speculatively selling pounds 
and buying Deutsche Marks, or other currency, the value of the pound started falling. So the Bank of England had to buy pounds with its currency reserves and gold. But in the end, the it didn't have enough, so it let the pound drop out of the system, and it fell, I don't know what, to, to 20 or something, I can't remember. And then a lot of the speculators then bought pounds back, and it went back up again, not all the way. but And, and Soros made a lot. I mean, I can't tell you what billion or 800 million right. of money and still quite a lot now now so who benefited from that well george soros nobody else so <laughs> i don't see the purpose inspector yeah i don't either and i i, I, I mean, see a ban it and if you say you it's just well you can't of course you can do it you know if i mean I'm a, to me it wouldn't be that hard but even if it was i, I think it was kennedy who says you don't do things it's so easy you do because they're hard i don't even think it's that hard I and mean, you do it in the 1970s when not, you know, we didn't have the tech we got now. You, you can't track all the transactions. Now, of course, libertarians would hate this because they hate the government being able to see what they're doing. You know, they or no, they or the it's inter- undermining markets, right? The natural, yeah, function. yeah. You know, I want, I want to use Bitcoin to buy guns or drugs and stuff. You know? <laughs> it's not up to the government to tell me I want to buy and sell currency to make myself more money. Uh, um, I want to short sell. Uh, shares so that I can drive the price down and make a load of money out of it. And the, the hardworking guys have got their shares in their pensions portfolio as well. They're just casualties. They should have done what I did, you know. They're not rational economic that, actors. Right? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't <laughs> but, buy uh, that right. You know, is a uh, you, you mentioned actually fixed in uh, floating exchange rates. That's something that my audience may or might not be familiar with. Uh, sort of. Fixed exchange rates are sort of a legacy of the gold standard, are they not? That sort of, I don't, I don't think most con- most countries use a floating exchange rate like the U.S. Yeah, dollar, yeah. Canadian dollar. Yeah. Uh, wh- is there any purpose in? Well, first of all, maybe we'll just explain what the difference is. Uh, and is there any use at all in a fl- fixed exchange rate? Because I certainly don't well, see why. Well, personally, would I would say now no. I mean, I think the fixed exchange rate system was the idea that. It would promote trade because you knew what about a currency was worth compared to another one, and it wouldn't move around. So if you were, you know, exporting and you were getting, you know, someone was paying you in dollars, and say so it was two dollars to the pound, you knew that you could exchange the dollars and end up with a pound, and that was it. Now, I guess notionally, when 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 foreign exchange markets weren't that big it was possible for national central banks by buying and selling currencies or and or cooperating to maintain those rates obviously with current market size that's not really feasible the other thing fixed exchange rates do is hem in government fiscal space so for example if you had a fixed exchange rate uh, and you expanded the economy then your people might get richer and they might spend that on imports, which would drive your exchange rate down. Well, currently, well, fine, just let the exchange rate go down. Your goods at the exports become more competitive, you know, there's no worries. But on the fixed exchange rates, you would have to involve fiscal retrenching to prevent your exchange rate going below its level. And that's what happened in Britain in post-war period when we were in the Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate system. So, you know, governments would expand, uh, the economy would get better employment levels, the imports would rise, a downward pressure on the pound, and then they would have to involve themselves in fiscal retrenchment, the so-called stop-go. You don't have to do that now. We can just let the exchange rate find its natural level. As I said, effects on infl- inflation from exchange rates are greatly exaggerated. You know, you might find the exchange rate drops, but it doesn't do an awful lot to inflation uh, and it makes your exports more competitive. So and given that a lot of countries like that idea, well, no worries. So the idea of an fixed exchange rate constrains governments. Now, if you go back to what we said before, a lot of people like that because they don't want governments to be free to do what they want and the ultimate fixed exchange rate system was the gold standard and gold bugs generally don't like governments to be free they don't trust them so that works friedman actually thought the idea of fixed exchange rates in theory was a good idea but what what he worried about is that it was subject to 
political meandering. So governments would kind of devalue and revalue and do lots of so in the end. What what Friedman did was he 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 went for floating rates, but the government should fix the growth of the money supply. So in a way, they both wanted to fix one thing and let markets do the rest, because in fixing one of them, it constrained the government. So if you imagine under fixed exchange rates, the government couldn't use expansionary fiscal policy. And pursue public purpose because you it would might reduce the exchange rate below the agreed level. So that was a good constraint. Friedman obviously had a money supply expansion rule where you could only allow the money supply to expand beyond a certain level. So that meant that the governments were constrained by the money supply rules from pursuing public purpose. So there were both ways of reining in governments, which the right wing liked because they did that. And if you say you want a floating exchange rate, you, you know, where governments can pursue political purpose and let the exchange rate move to its, the position it wants to go, they don't like that. And they will always, oh, what about it will crash? And as I said, these are greatly exaggerated. And if you wanted to, you know, you, as we said, you could use capital controls. But I'm very much in favour of floating rates. You know, uh, obviously... In an ideal world, you would have cooperation between the central banks of the world where they would look after each other. You would have cooperation between national governments where you had countries that were poor. So, you know, maybe in Africa, that so they weren't having to borrow US dollars to import things. If they were short of real goods and services, they would be just provided multilaterally to countries in need. And I'm moving more into politics there, but... I, I don't agree with fixed exchange rates. I don't think poor countries should be forced into borrowing in foreign currencies, you know, which many of them are from the IMF and stuff. There should be a, a way of helping them with real resources, particularly technology and manpower. Yeah, so a uh, sort of the dominant theory is what determines exchange rates, as you know, is the supply and demand of that, of that currency, mm. right? Now, yeah. if... If a government, let's say, is creating a lot of money through, I don't know, generous social programs, mm -hmm. like Bernie Sanders came to power. Yeah. And then a lot of people, quote unquote, didn't trust Bernie Sanders and didn't trust the US dollar. And they would, I don't know, speculate on the dollar, sell a mm -hmm. lot of it. Could that be a problem for the United States or any country for that matter, really? Like, let's say well, it was Corbyn in the UK. Yeah. Um, well, it's a could, potential could, problem, yeah. And could they just outlaw that basically by or sort of prevent that with uh, preventing speculation? Because mm -hmm. they're, I mean, that that's an argument I actually I've heard before is that mm -hmm. people, if if they ramped up government spending, people would lose faith in the dollar. Now that's kind of irrelevant when it comes to the citizens because they have to pay the tax anyway. But mm -hmm. for like foreign speculators, they could theoretically dump a lot of the currency. Yeah, the thing about it is. It it's like saying, I'm not going to go out in, when it's raining because I might get hit by lightning. <laughs> now, we'd agree, wouldn't we, that it's a technically, it could happen. So we are never going to go out it, it, when there's a chance of rain because we might get hit by lightning. We can stay indoors forever. Now, what these guys are actually saying, and let's be honest about it, let's distill it, we don't pursue public, public purpose by running the right level of deficit to get full employment and give everyone in the US or the UK a good quality of life flourishing because we're worried about currency speculators driving down the value of the currency. Now, for a patriot, and the Americans are good at that, doesn't that seem a bit gutless? And so the reality. What do you is, mean? Yeah, freedom. You know, is like not we're having, just going to like roll over. Freedom is not having health care. Freedom is dying yeah, on the yeah. street. Yeah, yeah. We dare do all this thing, cost of this currency speculators. I mean, it's just for a start off on its on its face, it's so cowardly. These are the sorts of guys, you know, 
the American flag and, you know, justice for all and America's the best country. But yeah, America didn't do any of this stuff because these nasty foreign speculators are stronger than us. Whoa. Well, that's the ridiculous part. But let's actually get to, instead of making stupid analogies, let's actually look at it. The actual reason is if, say, Bernie Sanders has been elected, so he did introduce, you know, medical programs. He ran the American economy at full employment. Well, let's have a look at it. Let's say there was a few currency speculators who thought, OK, I don't like this. I'm going to sell dollars. So the value of the dollar goes down. Now, immediately, though, when the value of the dollar goes down, they're going to think, well, I might buy it back now and make some profit. Plus, American exports are now getting more competitive plus the fact America is the world's reserve currency. And in times of crisis, people always go to the dollar, irrespective of its deficits. You'll notice that in the global crisis, even though America was the source of the crisis, it was subprime. I don't remember the dollar crashing, despite all the tarp and all the fact. So at the end of the day, the reality of it, I can't tell the future, you know, but if you're asking me what would happen, if Bernie Sanders had won, there may have been a small fall in the US dollar, you know, not great. It would be temporary. People would buy back dollars, who would move back into dollars. And once the economy I mean, well, does started it, running does a whole really load better, though? the value of the dollar would be higher now than it would have been uh, if, you know, let's say Bernie had, had won the election rather than Biden. With the, in my opinion, I can't tell you, there's lots of factors. Ceteris paribus, the value of the dollar be higher now probably than it would have been. Uh, and you, as I said, you could always ban speculation anyway. And you know what the Americans are like. They don't like foreigners interfering in their financial system. So right. my idea of borrowing, ba banning foreign speculation probably won't be too badly accepted by right-wing libertarians on a certain mm -hmm. angle, I think, you know, and, they uh, really like it. I mean, also the currency devaluing isn't necessarily always a bad thing. I mean, if you want to increase exports, for example, yeah. that's a better way to do it than, I don't know, Trump's stupid tariffs. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I guess, yeah, it depends on the country. Like a developing country might want to devalue its currency, sort of like what Vietnam and China do. Mm -hmm. It, a lot of times it depends what you do, you know, like you might think, well, exports are real costs, but you might think I'm going to sell stuff, you know, with a devalued currency. And then I, I, I've got more. And if you've got a, a high elasticity, you're going to make more foreign revenue and buy things to promote development in your country. So that's that's fine. You have to judge these things on merits. But all this like it's all sort of based on the worst case scenarios of which there's no evidence, you know, this, and, you know, this idea that, you know, every time you go out in the rain, you will get struck by lightning and you will die. You know, it's that, it just doesn't work like that. And you can't be held to ransom. You know, if the U S had a sensible government with Bernie at the helm, you know, well, the future's uncertain, but there's no reasonable grounds for assuming it would cause the dollar to crash at all. The only people saying that are people who just don't like Bernie and just are using that as a reason to keep any element of socialism or collectivism at bay. And it's just another platitude to come across, you know, and, and any time you hear a guy use money printing you know they don't understand the system it's <laughs> deliberately managed to conjure this image of weimar which was the wrong image as warren and i said anyway uh that you know and that inflation is caused by governments printing too much money it's just wrong on all levels you know so it's all tripe uh, which is an english term none of it stands up to scrutiny you know uh, and if, in, you know, when I, I do argue sometimes with mainstream economists about, you know, how banks work, how money is introduced, how uh, none of them can answer any questions. You know, none of them have got any chance. And I'm not a particularly intelligent guy. I'm just a school teacher, but I just understand the system. You know, when you say, how can the non-government sector pay taxes before the government spent the money into the system from the pay? They all look blank. Can't answer it. You know, 
uh, you know, so at the end of the day, there are element, tiny elements of truth in what they say, but they're exaggerated, misplaced, misconstrued to serve their political agenda, which is the point that you've made already in the thing, I think, very eloquently. Bill, it was great having you on. I think we covered everything pretty much that I wanted to cover. So that's great. Pretty long, pretty long episode, but I'm sure it'll be worthwhile for those who uh, have listened up till now. So uh, just one last thing, would you like uh, any, uh, anywhere people can find you anything you want to plug before we end it off? Yeah, I, I think I'd, I'd like to mention the Gower Initiative for Modern Modern Studies, their website, you know, put them into Google, you'll find it. I'd like to promote Warren's site, uh, you know, Warren Mosel's site, have a look at his mandatory readings, follow Billy Blog. Uh, and if you're interested in anything to do with money and the history of money, it's got to be Randy Ray. If you've not read The Deficit Randall Myth. Randall Ray, for those who don't Randall know. Ray, L. Yeah. Randall Ray, obviously get a hold of that. Uh, and if you're interested in Global South, anything like this, you would be looking at Fadel Gaboob. And if you're interested in the job guarantee, Pavlina Cheneva, she is the lady to follow, absolute expert. Uh, if you if you got access to uh, maybe, uh, I've written a book uh, myself, Can Heterodox Economics Make a Difference? It's ridiculously expensive. I can get a discount for you if you're interested in it. Uh, you know, just uh, you can get my email address from one dime um and so uh but uh, again it's very expensive there might be an ebook available or your university library might have it uh you know any questions on mmt i'm more than happy to answer i'm available on twitter through direct messaging so uh just philip armstrong or at phil armstrong 58 uh thanks very much for giving me the chance to talk about mmt and i hope your listeners really enjoy it and apologies if i've been a bit long-winded uh it's a fault oh, no, it's great pleasure to have you on I, this is exactly what i wanted out of this conversation is is the in-depth explanations because those who might want to who just watch my video are the ones who just want a quick explainer uh even mm-hmm. though it's, it's a 34 minute video it's not exactly short but uh because yeah. it's hard to as you know exp- summarize mmt but um, yeah. yeah, for the people here, yeah. Keeters, I'm, so I'm sure I'm sure they, they'll appreciate it. Yeah, I'm also happy to come back. And one thing I quite enjoy, and it's something you know, down the road, if you can get a major MMT and me, you get quite a lot of humor wow. in it. Because, you know, like if you heard me and Warren. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, that little bit of humorous interest and you get a yeah. few stories, you know, if, if you've heard the Weimar one, it adds a certain dimension because I trigger Warren and I nudge him for stories, you know? So if you've got, a, if there's someone you really want to get and you think, oh, well, I might get Phil on as well, just as a backup man, I'm happy to play second fiddle to one of the greats, you know? That, that, would, that would be amazing. That would, if uh, that could happen, that would be, that'd be a great episode, I'm sure. Yeah. Anyways, thanks for listening. You've been listening to One Dime Radio with Phil Armstrong. Working families are suffering. Unemployment is over 10% in my own district. We have over 2,300 people who have lost their homes to foreclosure. Retirement and pension funds are losing value. Local government can't make decisions. Four or five dollar bills, certain parts of the bill, you can get your blood spilt on the concrete. Little 17 year old nigga doing foul in the hood on the prowl out in these streets. I done been in the same situations, heartbeat racing, you come up or you don't eat. I done had to sleep in the train station, going stop to stop with no place to be paper chasing. Filling out applications for weeks, just trying to get up on my feet. But they ain't hiring, so a nigga was forced to resort to the street just to make ends meet. It's called survival. The struggle continues. If it offends you, let me remind you, we all have instinct to do what we have to do to make you through when this drive is prime. Whether you at Mickey D's taking an order or coming from Florida, transporting a quarter or on the corner, we all got needs. I gotta feed my son, he gotta feed his daughter. Now, I ain't no capitalist exporter, but I know the rules of supply and demand. Whoever control the product, control us supply. Well, hey, that's the law of the land. Make your own stimulus plan.
mean? It's a scam, it's a scheme. You should Google the Yamaro, then the Afro, then the Euro. Dollar bills don't make you royal. It can kill you, it can cure you. Love for money, root of evil. I say lack of it, that's more accurate. Army, Navy, special forces. Rob the land of its resources. Gold, oil, guns, ice, gas, corn, beans, rice. It's your life, you better think twice. How bad you want that name? 